Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing cardiac muscle contraction. Okay, so we now want, we've now discussed the structure of uh, a cardiac muscle cell and the contractile machinery within a cardiac muscle cell. We now want to discuss uh, the excitation contraction cup thing, by which I mean how are we going to make an action potential cause contraction of the, uh, of the muscle structure. Okay, so how are we going to couple the excitation at the membrane to contraction? So excitation, contraction, coupling. Okay, and this is done by converting the electrical signal of an action potential into a calcium signal, which we can then use to trigger um, contraction of the sarcomeres. So basically, in the T-tubule membranes, we have L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so let me draw one of these here. Okay, in fact, actually, I think I'll draw a bigger picture on the, the other side. Okay, so on the other side, we have our T-tubule here. Okay, or in the case of the atria, we don't have the T-tubules, and therefore this will just be at the normal cell membrane. So I'll talk about the atria in a moment. So, um, what we'll have is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, I just want to explain to you what an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is. So this is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, and the shorthand for voltage-gated calcium channel is to call it a VGCC. Now... Basically, voltage-gated calcium channels are not just one protein. They're a huge collection of proteins all stuck together, okay? And the main subunit, the most important subunit of this mass of proteins that are stuck together is a subunit known as the alpha-1 subunit. This is the subunit that actually makes the pore of the channel. Okay, now, in the human genome, there are 10 different genes for alpha-1 subunits, okay? We group them into three different families. We group them into the CAV1 family um, for voltage-gated calcium channel first family. We group them into the CAV2 family and the CAV3 family. So there are 10 genes. We group these into three families. Now, in the first family, there are actually four different genes in this first family. So there's the gene CAV1.1, there's the gene CAV1.2. It's going nicely. There's the gene CAV1.3. And then finally, there's the gene CAV1.4. So isn't that rather nice? Okay, these, all four of these genes that are in the first family are, can be code for alpha-1 subunits. And if you use one of these genes to make your alpha-1 subunit for your voltage-gated calcium channel, then your voltage-gated calcium channel will be an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So if you use a gene from this first family of um, genes for alpha-1 subunits, the CAV1s, uh, then uh, you will be an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So this is the L-types, okay? Whereas if you use it for the CAV2s, uh, sorry, if you use a gene from either the CAV2 family or the CAV3 family, you're not an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, now, voltage-gated calcium channels have other uh, auxiliary subunits attached onto this core subunit. So I'll just draw a few of these on. So here is the gamma subunit. Okay, so I'll put this in blue here. So in blue, we have the gamma subunit sitting next to the alpha-1 subunit. So this is gamma. Then we have beta, which is attached to the intracellular aspect of alpha-1 down here. And then finally, we also have alpha-2 delta, which sits over here. Okay, so this is alpha-2 delta. And alpha-2 delta really consists of two subunits, the alpha-2 subunit and the delta subunit stuck together. Uh, by disulfide bonds, but in actual fact, both of them are encoded by the same gene. So the gene for the alpha-2 delta subunit makes a protein which is then cut into um, pieces, um, two pieces, and those two pieces are then attached back together in a different way, and that makes you the alpha-2 delta subunit. So the delta bit is the bit that straddles the membrane, and the alpha-2 is the box here. Okay, right. 
So when a cardiac action potential occurs on this portion of membrane, what's going to happen is this voltage-gated calcium channel of the L-type is going to open. Now, calcium concentration in the extracellular fluid is 1.5 millimolar, or thereabouts. So this is the calcium concentration extracellularly. So we can write this calcium, and then we put square brackets around it to denote concentration of calcium, and then we put a little e here to denote that it's the extracellular concentration, and it's 1.5 millimolar. Whereas the intracellular concentration of calcium, so again, concentration of calcium, and now a little i for intracellular, is approximately equal to um, 100 nanomolar. So there's a, a 15,000 fold concentration gradient favoring the movement of calcium in. So basically the probability that a calcium ion will hit the channel from the extracellular aspect and go through into the cytoplasm is 15,000 times greater than the, than the chance that a calcium ion will hit from the intracellular aspect and go out. So you're going to get a net movement of calcium in easily. So you get a movement of calcium into uh, the cell through these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Now what this does is it causes a rise in calcium in the vicinity of this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Now that rise in calcium in the vicinity of an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel actually has a name. Someone has given that rise in calcium around an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel a name. It's known as a calcium sparklet. So it should feel rather honored to be given that name. Okay, so what is the calcium sparklet going to do? Is it going to cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte? The answer is no. The calcium sparklets, they are a calcium signal, and indeed a calcium signal is going to be what causes uh, the sarcomeres to start contracting. But the amount of calcium that comes in through these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is kind of pathetic, basically. So it's not enough to cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte. What we need to now do is hugely amplify this calcium signal, and we amplify it by getting it to cause release of calcium from the intracellular stores, and so-called calcium-induced calcium release. Now, before we just move on, I want to also say that these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, you will often hear these referred to by another name, especially when you're doing cardiac, uh, well, whenever you're doing uh, muscle physiology. You'll often hear them referred to as the dihydropyridine receptors, which just refers to the fact that they are sensitive to the dihydropyridine drugs, such as nifedipine. Okay, it's dihydro pyridine receptors. And dihydropyridine receptor is often abbreviated to DHPR, so dihydropyridine for DHP and then R for receptor. Okay, so it's not uncommon to hear these receptors refer, well, these channels referred to as dihydropyridine receptors. Okay, right. So, we now need to amplify this calcium signal. So, what happens? Well, basically, if we study the structure of these T-tubules a bit more, here's our T-tubule. What happens is the T-tubule is not just on its own, basically. If we have another T-tubule here, you will have an intracellular organelle that has little um, facets which join onto the membrane. So, this intracellular organelle is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which basically is an intracellular store of calcium. I mean, it's a lot more than just that, but as far as contraction is concerned, it's, it's a calcium store. Okay, so um, here are these facets which join on with the membrane here. So these are T-tubules here, so let me highlight up the plasma membrane. So we're still talking about a ventricular myocyte. We'll talk about how it's slightly different in an atrial myocyte later. So this is our ventricular myocyte here. This is our plasma membrane in purple. These are our T-tubules invaginating into the cytoplasm and bringing the electrical signal deeper into the cell. Okay, and then we have this sort of intracellular organelle which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is basically like the sarcolemma 
is another name for the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is just another name for the endoplasmic reticulum when we're talking about muscles. Okay, and it gives off these sort of facets which form these almost like synapses with the plasma membrane. Okay. And they're almost like calcium, they're cal well that is exactly what they are, they are calcium synapses, okay? So this intracellular organelle here, this is, the, um, is known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And basically it's just an endoplasmic reticulum but in a muscle cell, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And uh, people often refer to the sarcoplasmic reticulum just as the SR for short. Okay, so just abbreviating its two initials. Okay, right. Now it has these processes which interact with the membrane like the, this. And these are called calcium synapses. Okay, because what's going to happen is that you're going to get calcium coming in from the extracellular space through these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And what that's going to do is it's going to diffuse across this little cleft here, and in fact the gap between the plasma membrane, so this gap between the plasma membrane and the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that has a name, it's known as the dyadic cleft, okay? So the dyadic cleft means this gap between the membrane, in fact it's better shown here, the gap between the plasma membrane and the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum here, that's known as the dyadic cleft. Okay, and the calcium is going to act effectively like a neurotransmitter. It's going to bind to receptors on the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to activate those receptors. Okay, so the calcium sparklet is now going to activate uh, receptors in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.